please, don't overthink your entertainment at home. Ava! What? Experimentation has always been a hallmark of humanity. Whether it's putting a new spice in your omelet, or placing 17 people in the same room with a dancing baboon, we love to see what happens when new things interact in strange ways. Without that desire to combine different objects and see what they do, we wouldn't have things like composite materials, microchips, and basically anything invented since the sharpened spear. Every day we come up with new theories based on proposed interactions not yet tried, like crossover movies between superheroes or the cure for cancer via viral manipulation. Yet despite this urge to keep progressing forward, there's a whole slew of beliefs that get carried along for the ride, many without question. For instance, let's say I chase a black cat under a ladder and accidentally break a mirror. Well, there's no empirical evidence to support I'll get bad luck, but half of you cringe just the same. And what's the common logic about applying this need to experiment to the old adages? Don't bother, it's true, everybody already knows it. We have a whole subculture of truths largely untested that dictate minutia of everyday lives. Why don't we test those beliefs? Well, a small group of people tested exactly that for well over a decade. Today, we talk about Mythbusters. <laughs> One of the television series that took Discovery out of its documentary phase, the Mythbusters are experts in special effects who use their abilities to recreate the conditions surrounding urban myth, testing whether or not it's feasible in reality what is commonly believed. It's a strange concept that worked amazingly well. After three pilots, the series was picked up and became one of the most successful factual television series of all time. But my question is, why? Why would a show featuring no scientific experts centered around explosions actually get the attention of academia, writers, and political leaders? What made this happy accident of a program the perfect storm of science, entertainment, and busting commonly accepted norms? Let's find out as sociology looks at Mythbusters, why we cared. It was far from the first factual television series to debut. You could technically count the early episodes of Mythbusters as documentaries of their efforts to test myths, since the initial pilots were a little sparse on entertainment filler. I'm talking very sparse. The shot actually lingers on longer. I'm, I'm cutting it short. The whole formula from those first few episodes speaks of a very different show. It was actually more like a scientific beyond belief, fact or fiction. You know, that actually speaks volumes as to why this line is in the opening. They don't just tell the bits. <laughs> wow, I can feel the pressure. They put them to the test. That makes so much more sense now. With every other station having its own variant of that unsolved mysteries weird aspect of society, Discovery wanted to throw in its hat. Mythbusters took the usual speculative nature of these programs and put them to the test with measurable science. So they inserted hard science into their myths. and. Really, the hard science was just creating the circumstances again using all of their special effects know-how, which is cool to watch, but in the beginning it really was fact or fiction. They knew the outcome of the myth before they started. It was, this is confirmed or busted. That's what the research team is for. But it really became a little bit of an issue when they proved something could happen, but it was officially busted because it didn't. See, that's where they actually stole a move from real scientists. They adapted. When a myth was proven possible, but not confirmed happened, they labeled it plausible. And that little category opened up the floodgates of possibility. No longer were they chained to news stories and history books. They could instead use this team of special effects experts and researchers to do bigger, better, and more fantastically ridiculous concepts than the world had ever seen before. That's reason one why we cared. We watched them grow. Additionally, from Season 2 on, the Mythbusters featured special episodes that involved revisits, where the team would tackle a topic again, this time either with a new method, since the original results are in dispute, or testing a new facet of the myth that was missed the first time around. They did often gloat about this, saying that they were brave enough to go back and test just to silence the critics, but they aren't wrong. Television is a medium that actually shows repeats quite often, so to use repeat footage of an old experiment in the middle of retesting it that's insane! Very bold move, and it paid off because the fans realized that they mattered. That's why these episodes were done, because the input needed to be addressed. 
Retesting myths and working with the power of online feedback, the Mythbusters fine-tuned their interactions with the audience to the point where they began crowdsourcing material. Many specials based solely on viewer requests made the fans feel like an integral part of the process. And there's reason too. They respected the audience. So going back and testing these was not only trying to, you know, appease someone, but it was also showing that they too are capable of making mistakes. How often did they go out of their way to show how flawed they were? Oh no! Oi! Got a leak over here too. What happened to Tori's airtight box? Come on! It's busted the tank. I think we're cooked for today. I think we're cooked for today. Damn it! Ow! Very. No one's perfect, and the Mythbusters seem to proudly show this characteristic. The main pair of Adam and Jamie often got on each other's nerves, having spats over differences in designs and mocking each other nearly every chance they got. Not to mention the missteps in design, the holdups due to someone gluing the wrong end into an expensive piece, or even entire experiments ending in failure. George the Ram. This show took risks, taking its stars off of the pedestals of perfection you usually see TV hosts on, and showing that they make mistakes and they have bad judgment sometimes, just like us. So that leads us to reason three. We identify with them. Beyond that, each member of the team brought their own insight and method to the project, making each experiment a unique experience. Often the main duo would handle myths differently than the trio that makes up the build team did. Oh, the build team, that infamous other half of the Mythbusters equation. Let's go to the DM so he can weigh in on their influence. To get him there, you know, they just grabbed this werewolf, who was in full wolf form at the, at the time, put roller skates on each of its paws, water skiing handles in its mouth, strapped that to the back of the car and, and took off, and, and what? Just wondering if you remembered that we have a show to do. Um, I'm doing my show. No, no, no. You're bit for my show. You remember you weigh in on character insights and... Oh! Well, you know, the contracts, you know, expired. What?! And you never showed up for renegotiation. How did my legal team miss you this? you never, you know, showed Kevin. up to the 900 hours that you owe me for role-playing as is. So I just kept doing this. What exactly are you doing? It's my show. Haven't you been paying attention? No. I... Okay, can you just tell me quick about the build team from Mythbusters, then? Oh, um... Uh, well... I know, like, Grant Imahara likes robots, and the girl's pretty cute, and, uh... Uh... I kinda wanna punch the third guy in the face. Like, a lot. Thank you, that was very insightful. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's all I'm getting, isn't it? So anyway, that's when they shaved the werewolf! Shaved the werewolf. Shaved the 14-foot-tall, snarling hell beast. And that's how fans of Mythbusters felt when the build team left. Seriously, it happened after one random episode, and they didn't even get to do a video sign-off. They got a picture montage. True, they didn't appear until Season 2, and Grant wasn't even a part of it until Season 3. At this point, I'm thinking they're never going to bring Scotty back. Poor tattooed welder. Gone with the myth turns. But it's hard to imagine what the show would have become without these three bright-eyed builders knocking out the myths Adam and Jamie didn't want. Sometimes they ended up with the good ones, too. Why would you let someone else do this if you had the chance to? Seriously. But, on special occasions, the two teams came together to form one brain trust to tackle the biggest myths in town. And that's where we get reason for. Chemistry. Like watching a good kitchen staff work together, there was something awesome about how these five individuals pulled out the spectacles they managed. In later seasons, when it became less about the science and more about the entertainment, they really lost the dynamic between the members. Just didn't see them working together as often, and that was really sad. And that's where the wheels on the Mythbuster Mobile started to shake, because the producers started treating them as actors armed with puns, rather than the capable, creative people who built these awesome things and worked great together in a natural work environment. Believe it or not, the revamp that occurred after the build team left gave fans of the show exactly what they'd missed out on all those years. The human mistakes behind the scenes, the flubs, the arguments, the feeling that these were guys just like anyone else that just happened to have the resources to pull off amazing things to prove silly little points. But were the points silly? 
I'll argue that with reason five. These myths mattered. Discovery actually tried to make some ripoffs of their own show, taking parts of Mythbusters that worked, such as big explosions slash destruction and high speed footage, and putting them in Smash Lab and Time Warp, respectively. These shows lasted a combined length of three and a half seasons, because they didn't have the drive of culture behind them. For every episode where they tenderize a steak with explosives, you'll find at least five that truly blow your mind. They can either shatter or affirm your long-held belief passed down from family through generations sometimes of these beliefs, adages, or just concepts that are locked into your head. And that moment where it either confirms or busts these things that you know to be true, it's amazing. That's why people cared, and why the scientific community acknowledges what this show did for television. It made people think, actively question, and want to see tests before believing a fact. While their methods were not always spot on, they admitted when they fell short and encouraged their audience to question their findings. Mythbusters wanted everyone to become involved, because it's our society that made the myths they're testing. They wanted us to be invested in these small little facets that make up little parts of all of our lives. And it worked. With each episode, their methods improved, they gave us better answers, and they made us question further every little aspect. And not to just accept things at face value. The Mythbusters have done lecture tours, have honorary degrees, and Adam Savage was even featured in a TED Talk about the scientific method. You should definitely see the whole thing, linked in the description, but here's my favorite line. Most people think of science as a closed black box, when in fact it is an open field, and we are all explorers. So, while the show's opening famously says, please don't try this at home, what they really meant is, please don't blow up your house doing what we do, but do keep your mind open to all the possibilities that surround you. And that's a beautiful thought. I'm Socio, and I miss Mythbusters already. And the Mythbusters seemed proud to show this characteristic. The main pair of Amy and Jana. Amy. That was a weird name.